Dear listeners, welcome at this episode in the fourth series, fourth season of the Meet the Expert podcast series. In this series, together with well-known experts from around the globe, we explore challenges and opportunities in the big veterinary world. And in this episode, we'll discuss the topic of sustainability and profitability. And we do so with a very well-known name in the industry, being Robert Hoste, a part of Wageningen University in Research, based in the Netherlands. And that name may sound familiar because this is the second episode we record with him. We spoke to him earlier about swine production worldwide. I said today we'll focus at sustainability and how to achieve that profitably. So welcome once again, Robert. Thank you. Welcome. Good to see you. Likewise. Um, the Meet the Expert podcast series is a co-production of Bering Ingelheim Animal Health and Pig Progress. My name is Vincent Tabeek. I'm editor of Pig Progress and I'm host of today's episode. And present at this podcast is also audiovisual editor Iris Hoffman, without whom this podcast wouldn't be possible. Our guest Robert Hoster is senior pig production economist at Wageningen Economic Research in the Netherlands. He has over 30 years of experience in economic issues on farm and sector level, as well as in supply chain cooperation and international studies. He has a wide network in the industry in the Netherlands and worldwide, and uh, for many years has been involved in projects around the world, including South Korea, China, Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico, to name a few, all aimed at improving performance and efficiency of big farm management. As said, today's focus will be at sustainability and how to achieve that whilst also producing profitably. Well, Robert, um, before we start talking about the topic of sustainability in detail, is it something that is relevant for you as a pig production economist? Oh, definitely, yes. <clears throat> Some people consider economy as limited to financial issues, such as cost and revenues, but it contains actually the entire field of managing scarce inputs, such as uh, labor, clean water, pig health, etc. So it's, it's more than that. It's sustainability also keeps like a, in my head, it's like um, trying to uh, um, pave the way for the future as well, to be able to produce in the future as well. That also involves economic sustainability, doesn't it? Definitely. It is actually, uh, so uh, I define sustainability as a combination of the four P's, mm -hmm. the people, planet, pigs, and profit. Well, we know the, the triple P, people, planet, profit, but in my opinion, we should have a separate uh, P's for the, for the pigs, for animal health, animal welfare. And this should be taken in, in balance. Indeed, you, you mentioned the balance already. So there's no additional animal welfare possible without sufficient payment. There, um, well, you know, all these kinds should be taken in, in well balance, uh, healthy animals, a good income, uh, taking care of the planet, etc. Yeah. People and then generally spoken, you could, mm -hmm. you, you could say uh, high performing anim animals uh, are a good starting point for sustainability. And, uh, that, that, is, um, that, that is a good start. Um, well, since we're having a focus on um, the veterinary world as well, do antibiotics form part of that sustainability discussion? Uh, yes, it is definitely a part because it's related to animal health, but it's more than that. It's also uh, public health. Many countries worldwide started to give attention to it to reduce antibiotics use in the animal husbandry, aiming to take care of the antimicrobial resistance. And well, reduction can be done at zero cost, but maybe not in all countries, or definitely not in all countries, because antibiotics can be used and are being used to hide mismanagement. And especially in, in countries where there are lots of animal diseases going around, it is easy to apply uh, antibiotics bucket-wise, so to say, as to uh, well to to hide it. That there's there's a lack of of good management. So to be able to reduce the antibiotics, there's more necessary than just saying, "Well, you have to reduce, and that's it," <clears throat> because you have also to take care of the health of the animals. So the entire management should be uh, um, well. Um, it should be uh, thought from the very beginning, how do we 
take care of our animals? How we how do we apply the labor? How do we look at the animals? How is the how are the facilities designed, etc.? It's a combination of everything where the antibiotics is is related to. I can imagine antibiotics have been top of mind in in in, uh, oh, in North America, Europe. Uh, I would say Australia, New Zealand as well. But um, let's let's look at. Slightly more traditional markets still, like Asia or Latin America, um, or how will they deal with it? Well, countries like China, they do have a governmental policy. There's there's a clear uh, central uh, policy from the Chinese government. But then the translation uh, to practical measures is not very easy. It is to be implemented yet. And, well, they have very large companies. They are aware of their responsibility. They are considering measures. But then... As we learned from our own uh, experiences in the Netherlands and in, in neighboring countries, it is very much related to awareness. So how do we deal, how do we consider to, to deal with the animals? And this is important. So not only uh, tangible measures uh, or just ceilings of, uh, of a use of antibiotics, whatever, but also awareness of how do we deal with the animals. Is, there is also a transparency component in it, I think. I mean, also wanting to show where things might be improved. I, I think that could be sometimes a bit of a cultural issue as well. It is a, it is definitely related to culture and um, the system how it is in the in the Netherlands is based on communication and measuring and benchmarking. So all the farmers uh, were told, well, given uh, these number of bottles that you are using on your farm of each type of antibiotics, your daily doses level is this or that. So uh, everyone had some figure. And then you could compare with other farmers. And this benchmarking, if done in a fair way, so you can trust the figures, etc., cetera, it, it is uh, very informative uh, because then you can learn. It's not to boast, it is to, to, sh to, well, to show yourself where you can learn and where you should uh, try to reduce the antibiotics application. I think that the transparency and the communication part is also relevant for animal health issues. Well, I mean, I've seen it quite often when you're dealing with African swine fever, that if you don't know where the virus is or where it has spread to, then it's more difficult to use policies there as well. So animal diseases also have a, have a link to sustainability. But uh, could, you, could you explain a little bit more deeply how they are intertwined? There are so many different diseases and they have different effects. So, um, well, but, but generally spoken, they lead to impaired performance. As an example, the PRRS in the USA and also what we see now in Spain, they lead to losses of up to, well, let's say 20, 30 percent. Mortality figures very, very high. So this is direct loss in economic sense. It is a direct loss also for um, well, let's say uh, feed efficiency, so the planet issue, but also the labor, the joy of labor is uh, impaired. So different aspects, not to say all aspects of, of sustainability are, uh, are related here. And well, uh, one answer or at least a direction of thinking is the biosecurity, which is uh, a good prevention. So biosecurity on the farm is always very good. By security, good farm management are uh, paramount to manage diseases. And it is not only tangible measures, as I mentioned already before, like a disinfection unit, uh, but it's also, re again, it's related to awareness. And a nice example, I was in South Korea on a pig farm and I could enter the farm easily without uh, taking other clothes, etc. But there was a disinfection unit at the entrance, obligatory. And it looked like a phone booth and it functioned that uh, a visitor should enter the booth and then being sprayed with uh, citric acid and being, um, uh, well, and then UV light was also shed on the visitor. But I didn't use it. It was not necessary, said the farmer. And then the veterinarian said, well, it is not being used and it doesn't work. So. According to obligation, uh, mandatory, uh, they had uh, a tangible measure, disinfection unit, but it was not used and it is not helpful. So when it is not between the ears that it is really necessary to disinfect already at the entrance of the, of the farm, so what will you do on the farm? 
and this was a good farm actually. So I was really surprised and that is why I, I, I uh, reminded as an example, it's not only tangible measures, it's also the other measures, the, the awareness. Yeah, trying try to get it between the ears, so to say. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Now the differences among farms are huge and um, not to express it in, um, in in animal diseases, but in, in the MSY, for example. MSY? Already with the, the, the MSY, yes, that's the, the number of marketed swine per sow and year. So let's say the slaughter you. pigs produced per yeah. sow and year. Within the Netherlands already, which is almost at the top level on average, there's uh, a variation of, I guess, between 23 and 35 slaughter pigs produced per sow and year. And when we compare it to the average in China, there the MSY amounts to some 17. Well, some farms are at 25 or even uh, a bit beyond, but many, many are even uh, uh, at 10. Or uh, So it is. Uh, this is a combination of a lack of management, a lack of uh, good hybrids and good feed, but also the diseases going around everywhere. Yeah, that's... Uh, well, but we've discussed the animal diseases. Um, let's take a look at animal welfare, also a component of sustainability, if you ask me. Um, where does that come in in the, in the sustainability equation? Animal welfare, uh, for me, it is part of uh, the, the, the pig, you know, the four P's and then the, the, the P of pigs. And what we see here is that especially European countries are leading. Um, demands uh, include living space, daylight, better climate, uh, etc. And now an increasing attention for a ban on castration and tail docking. And especially the tail docking is being discussed in European Union. And I would expect this to be common practice, the ban on tail docking, let's say, uh, well, in, in the foreseeable future, in, in 10 or 15 years, it might be... Uh, uh, might be common practice, let's say. Now, with increasing animal welfare demands, and this is really important, the, the real craftsmanship is demanded. A farmer must be able to observe by seeing, feeling, sniffing, and knowing how to act. So it is not only your hands that are needed, but uh, rather your eyes and ears, so to say. And this craftsmanship is uh, is really important for the future, especially when uh, having the pigs with the long tails, the intact tails. Yeah, uh, I hear a plea the, for, uh, for precision farming in this sense as well. I mean, uh, all kinds of um, technologies that can help detect diseases or well, uh, things that are going wrong in the farm earlier. Definitely. Uh, because um, for, for, for uh, dealing with intact tails and all those other additional animal welfare demands, it is necessary to have more labor available. And it is not so easy to find workers on the farms, employees. Um, and, and so you, you can have some support of uh, electronic devices like uh, microphones, sensors, etc., to 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 know what is going on on the farm as an assistant. But in the end, the farmer must have this in the fingers. Otherwise, he or she will not be able to manage it uh, in the right way. And who's going to pay and, for that? Exactly. Who's going to pay for that? Because it comes at quite some cost. Mm. And... Um, and so the consumers and the industry need to get used to it. Yes, the, the meat will become more expensive. And well, looking back in history, part, uh, the part of our wallet uh, that we spent to food uh, after the Second World War, let's say, uh, was far higher than it is at this moment. So um, yes, we have to get used to it and pay more for the food, yes. I see, I see. And um, what well, we you've been talking about Europe. Um, in the United States, they're talking about the, the Prop 12, the developments. Um, where do you see that go? Well, the Prop 12, uh, to, to explain it uh, very briefly, it's the decision of the Californian government to ban individual housing systems for gestating sows. And, and more than that, but this is the core for uh, for pig production. And not only for the Californian producers themselves, but it holds also for all the products sold in the state. Well, now they, they do purchase a lot of pig meat from other states in the US because they don't produce sufficiently. And uh, so such producers in the rest of the US have to comply with their standard. And this is a nice example in two perspectives. On one hand, it suits in the US approach of the large integrations and they are rather easily being able to adopt customer standards, uh, customer demands. 
but it comes at a cost. So someone or some companies do have to, uh, to adapt. But this is possible, especially because they are integrated. On the other hand, it shows that wealthy citizens are more likely to adopt additional welfare requirements for animal husbandry. And so the decision in California has been made with a clear majority. Uh, so this will happen definitely, and it was decided by, by the judges, etc. So yes, the, the U.S. production has to be changed to some extent. Some integrators will adopt those standards, others not or not yet. I see, I see. Okay, well, we've been talking about antibiotics. We've been talking about uh, animal diseases and animal welfare. Um, I think climate also is something we need to talk about. Um, where does climate fit in, in this whole picture? Yeah, so <laughs> the core of the, uh, the the planet protection is the challenge to transfer the Earth to the next generation without compromise. And it relates to CO2 footprint, to biodiversity, to the water footprint, to soil, uh, uh, soil to wood forest conservation. And what we typically see, it is a combination of legislation and an industry approach. So legislation, the government is setting goals. Uh, this is the maximum of search or that. So for the, the water quality, for example, or a CO2 footprint, but the CO2 footprint is typically set by the industry. So a retailer saying, um, uh, dear supplier, you have to reduce the CO2 footprint in the production chain by 55% or whatever. And this is common practice. So it is a combination of uh, legislation and the industry. That, 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 that makes sense. Um, I think we're probably aware of uh, here in the Netherlands, as well as in neighboring Belgium, there is a big debate about going on about uh, nitrogen deposition in the environment. And uh, they're looking at livestock production and uh, asking livestock production to cut down production as well to be able to lower the nitrogen depositions. Um, there's a big debate going on about it in these two countries. Um, but sometimes it's hard to see what is the global perspective. Do you think that nitrogen can become a problem globally or is it something that will typically be something for the low countries here in Europe? At least for now, it is related to uh, to Netherlands and Belgium. And it is it, it, is, it comes uh, through the high density of people and animals in our rather small countries, the Netherlands and Belgium. And the density is also found in some other areas like Brittany in France or Northwestern Germany or Northern Italy. But then it is only on a regional scale, not on a national scale. So that's why I don't expect this to spread further so much. It will be typically a situation in the Netherlands or Belgium. But on the other hand, the European Commission issued the plan of the Green Deal, and this will impact the entire Union. Um, protecting the planet, but also, um, well, by, by reducing nitrogen, but also pesticides, antibiotics, animal welfare is involved. So it, it, there's a lot of measures all in all in this uh, big package of uh, the European Commission. And this will impact the entire commission, uh, Union. Yeah, well, and certainly it will lead to new insights, I suppose, uh, how to kind of reduce nitrogen levels in, uh, in pig production. Um, I would like to look ahead into the future and who better to introduce than, than my colleague Iris Hofman. Um, you have a couple of questions to help uh, steer the, 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 the discussion in the future direction. Yes, absolutely. And it's nice to see you again, Robert. Um, well, I've been listening to this podcast and I think that the main question is um, if it's possible to come to an integrated sustainable production system and still earn money with it. I think yes, it is still uh, it is possible. Uh, so sustainable is it yet uh, profitable? With a question mark that was the title of the podcast. It, uh, I would say yes, definitely. But the consumer price of meat will increase, and this is what we see already in the Netherlands. Uh, that the the price of pig meat in the in the shop is some 30, 35 percent higher than it was some five years ago, and the further rise is to come because new animal welfare demands are coming and the feed price has risen, etc. Now, this probably leads to some reduction of the consumption level, but you might mention there's also kind of sustainability. Eating less, not for everyone, but especially for those consumers who are eating already quite some amount of meat. Exactly. And yeah, well, meat is a healthy product and uh, happy are those consumers who can afford a sustainable piece of meat on their plate. 
exactly. Do you think that meat is going to be a luxury product in the future for some? Yes, it might definitely be possible that it is not affordable anymore for, for parts of the consumers. But here a good marketing strategy is needed to offer a variety of products with different price classes to the consumer so that also those with a small wallet are able to, to buy meat to buy this product and others can buy more luxurious products on a higher level of, let's say, and welfare demands or whatever they, they want to pay for for good recipes uh, going with the product or nice packaging, you know. So there are uh, ample opportunities also with marketing to provide both the, the bigger wallets and the smaller wallets, let's say, uh, to provide them with a good product. Exactly. Well, thank you. Those were my questions. Um, thank you. Um, I, I just would like to to to, um, to to wrap up this podcast briefly but with, with um with one general question, uh, you introduced um, the, 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 the four P's in the, earlier in the podcast, the people, planet, pigs and profit. Um, which one of those four is the most important in your opinion? In a good balance, there is not a, the one single most important one, but uh, I would like to focus on the people. Mm -hmm. Profit is is uh, very well known and it is underestimated maybe, but the people is also very important. There is a need for skilled workers who are trained and get sufficient responsibility on the farms, especially in countries like China. Um, well, labor circumstances for the farmer, for employees, but also the deal, uh, how to deal with neighbors, uh, for example, with odor, uh, but also the responsibility to provide healthy food to consumers, the trust among players in the supply chain. They are all elements to be addressed in this P of people component. Yeah. And one last question that, 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 that pops up in my mind when we, well, when you look at the general news, when you look at um, well, the people outside of the industry, when you talk about sustainability, they'll probably have an idea of pastures full of um, pigs grazing there for a long time. And you know, those who are working in, industry, in the industry, they'll probably realize that it comes with drawbacks if, if you want to feed the world that way. Would you consider that sustainable as well? In, in some perspectives, it is uh, uh, sustainable because the um, the consumer is given what he or she wants and as long as the consumer is paying for it, it's possible to have uh, a number of pigs uh, uh, grazing in, in the pasture. Mm -hmm. It would be possible, but it's not, not possible then to feed the world with the same level of consumption as we have right now. So then it go should go hand in hand with the lower consumption level. Uh, otherwise, it will be very difficult. So those who wish to pay more for uh, high animal welfare, they should also kind of restrict themselves and say, OK, we're going to indulge in one piece of meat a week and for instance, and then oh, for the rest, uh, stay away from it, for instance. It, it is technically possible to, to have gold plated meat if you wish, but <laughs> this is maybe not exactly meat, but it would be possible. Yes. Fair enough. That, that sounds good. Well, I think um, We've gone through our list of questions, so I think it's time to uh, draw this uh, podcast to an end. Um, I trust that our listeners are now completely up to date where, where we stand in the world of pig swine production. And I would like to thank you once more for being with us in this podcast, in this Meet the Expert podcast series. As said, we also recorded a previous episode with Robert Hoster in which we discussed the swine production worldwide with attention for major swine producers producing areas globally. And you will find it through your regular podcast channels as well as at Big Progress. Just search for the Meet the Expert by Big Progress and Bering Ingelheim Health. Um, Robert, I thank you for being with us. I thank our audience for being with us. And Hopefully, we'll hear, we'll uh, can welcome everybody back at the next podcast soon. Thank you very much. Bye bye.